Thank you, thank you, Eduardo and Sanjay, for inviting me to present uh, our experience on genomic selection in CIMIT maize breeding program. Uh, so I'm presenting on behalf of a lot of people, molecular breeder, quantitative genetics, uh, and conventional uh, breeders. Okay, uh, so before just I go directly to um, how genomic selection is applied in CIMIT maize breeding program, I will just give you some background how we uh, reorient our uh, maize breeding program in Eastern and Southern Africa, especially the last couple of uh, years through uh, a, a project which is funded by uh, Bill and Million Targets Foundation. Uh, so in Eastern and Southern Africa, currently we have uh, five different product profiles, uh, three in Eastern Africa and two in Southern Africa. Uh, each of these product profile have uh, their own uh, a trade package for must-have and nice-to-have trade. Uh, the target country is already uh, mentioned in there. And then in total, uh, this uh, five product profiles is serving around 14 million uh, hectare in Eastern and Southern Africa. So uh, in terms of, uh, we currently uh, reoriented our maize, maize breeding program uh, through stage gate advancement process. Uh, we, currently we have from making crosses to variety release, and we have a set of different uh, uh, people, uh, line development breeder like me, we are only focusing, developing high uh, performing lines from making crosses uh, going through stage one and stage two, stage three up to uh, variety release. Uh, so if you see this, uh, this is a stage three in maize. Uh, this is, uh, we call it a third stage of testing. Uh, previously, a couple of years ago, uh, we were recycling lines uh, after stage three. Uh, but the last two years, we just moved uh, recycling lines from stage two. And currently, we are just discussing and uh, developing a standard process. Uh, uh, operating procedure to recycle line as a stage one. Uh, and then after that, from stage three, stage four is just product development. Stage five is on-farm trial. And then after that, just variety release and uh, uh, by seed and nurse partners. Uh, so uh, just to give you in, in terms of stage one, which currently I'll, I'll talk about a little a minute. Uh, in terms of uh, stage one, uh, currently we are applying genomic straight, uh, estimate breeding value uh, just to uh, increase the selection intensity and, and also select the line based on uh, GEP to move to stage two. Uh, from stage two to stage three, uh, this is uh, in addition to uh, the blab, we also use GCA blab. Uh, to select lines uh, which move uh, for recycling. And from stage three to stage four, this is a team decision. Uh, we have uh, the whole team in the maize product development team. We sat together and then advance which lines move from stage three to stage four and then from stage four to uh, stage five. Uh, so this is uh, some of the uh, trade package and advancement threshold for each product profile. This is just an example. Uh, so this is a, a basic trade, uh, a must have and nice to have trade and what is our product target and what is a, a market priority hybrid. So we identified uh, for each uh, product profile, what is the dominant uh, uh, commercial hybrid, and then our advancement is based on uh, that uh, particular commercial hybrid, uh, because our intention is uh, to develop a hybrid, which is to replace the current commercial dominant hybrid. And then, uh, so uh, Eduardo mentioned in terms of sampling the target population environment, I, I think like a CIMIT, um, our, our, our focus is, is not only high yield, it is just stress tolerant, uh, disease resistant. 
So in Africa, we have this now maize lethal necrosis, which is one of the uh, virus diseases which affect maize production, tersicum, leaf blight, and drought, and then the also optimum. So our hybrid is they should be stress tolerant at the same time if there is adequate rainfall and the fertilizer should be also input responsive. So um, uh, the objective is very difficult uh, just to, to bring together all this into, into a single hybrid, but we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, several uh, hybrid which is currently commercialized in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, so uh, this is just an example of the breeding scheme uh, in, 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 in one of our product profile. Uh, so we, we have two uh, streams. One is if you want to uh, integrate some of the material for full army or for MLN, or if you want to bring some uh, temperate materials, so there is a separate a pipeline, I haven't just bring that one into this discussion, uh, but for, for uh, elite by elite line, uh, we, from our breeding program, we selected elite by elite, uh, make F1, and then uh, submit for uh, double haploid. Uh, we have a double haploid facility here in Simit, Kenya. And then we just receive uh, 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 several a thousand of DH line, and then just we put those one in the nursery in the short uh, two or three um, in just in one meter nursery, very short, and then only for a seed increase and the per se selection. After that, we have uh, a marker which is linked to uh, maize streak virus and MLN. Uh, so these are just. Uh, uh, a functional marker, so we can just genotype with those and then discard which is susceptible before they go to the first stage yield trial. So in the first stage yield trial, uh, we, we are currently only uh, phenotyping half of them. Uh, so we just keep half of them in the cold room, uh, but we genotype all of them. And based on uh, those stage one yield trial, which is just three to five location, uh, because we have to put also drought and low nitrogen. And then based on those stage one, uh, we predict the remaining uh, a thousand lines, sometimes more. And the selected lines from both phenotypic selection and uh, genom genomic estimate breeding value we put into three tester we could, that that is now our stage two and those is evaluated in five to eight location so uh, that this is just the one which is a, a black arrow is the previous one but currently we are recycling after stage two yield trial so we have reasonable uh, GCA data and per, per se performance, so we can just select elite line uh, to make new crosses. So, and then it goes to stage three, and then uh, we call it regional trial, uh, which is 30 to 40 location in the target population of environment, evaluated by nurse partner and seed company. And the best five to seven hybrid uh, will go to on farm trial. Uh, so those are probably sometimes uh, it goes to up to 50 location and then uh, based on farmer selection criteria yield uh, will advance, uh, we will announce some of the hybrid uh, for interested uh, uh, nurse partners and uh, seed company partners. So uh, let me just go directly how we are currently using genomic selection. Uh, one is rapid cycle genomic selection. Uh, that is uh, one application of GS. And the second one is to uh, predict the performance of uh, unphenotype genotype at early stage of testing. So uh, uh, that is the second uh, application of GS in CMIT maize breeding program. Uh, so uh, this rapid generation advancement using GS, uh, we started this a little bit uh, uh, five, six years ago uh, within biparental population. And so uh, we did more than 34 biparental population uh, and then each population phenotype two to four managed and three to four well water environment. 
and genotype with low and high density marker. So at the beginning, uh, we were not sure whether high density marker or low density marker is enough for advancement. And we uh, did uh, 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 genetic gain study. So this is a, a, a workflow, uh, I think. So this one is just a previously, probably we can just a little bit modify, but in general, you select your two elite material in maize, in this case, with a heterotic group. And then uh, we screened uh, those uh, <coughs> line A and line B uh, for polymorph polymorphism. And then F1, uh, just we want to make sure that all F1 come from A uh, cross A and B. So we use a uh, quality control genotyping. And here, just F2 drive and F3, this is a time we just genotype uh, with uh, a high density marker. Uh, currently, we can do that with a medium density marker. And then at the same time, so we make this one a tester. So this is the initial plan. Uh, uh, so this one is just currently we are just modifying. I'll, I'll show you uh, later. Uh, but at that time, we just make a test across and evaluate those one one across location and use those one as a training set and then uh, 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 develop the genetic estimate breeding value for each line. And then based on this, uh, you have to advance in cycle one. And then from cycle one to go to cycle two, uh, this is uh, one which is um, uh, very critical in terms of the time from leaf sampling up to pollination. So you have to have a good service provider uh, to give you the marker data within a short period of time and should be analyzed by quantitative genetics or biometrician and get the uh, GEB uh, for making uh, the crosses. And then from cycle to the same at cycle three. So as the initial stage, so we just, just should to make sure that we advance it also through pedigree breeding program from this cycle zero to make sure that is there any uh, difference between phenotypic selection and genotypic, genotypic, gen, uh, genotypic estimate breeding value. And then uh, at cycle three, so this is a stage uh, we submitted for uh, double haploid uh, or line extraction. Uh, so we did a genetic gain study. Uh, so this is just simply to show you those, uh, the training set has to be uh, phenotype in the target population of environment. If it is a drought, you have to evaluate under drought. If it is a disease, you have to also evaluate under disease and also under optima. So this is just uh, some of the results we got from eight uh, biparental population. Uh, you can see cycle zero is a bar, which is a black one, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. So overall, this is under drought. Uh, so this is grain yield uh, in, in the y-axis, in the x-axis is the population. And you can see the overall gain is 70 kilogram per hectare per year. Uh, so this is under drought. Uh, and just if you compare this uh, with a conventional breeding in Africa, under drought is around 32 kilogram per hectare per year. Uh, so you can see it's, uh, um, just rapid cycling is in genomic selection almost uh, two times compared to the conventional uh, uh, line development program. So because in CIMIT, uh, our focus is to, to develop a product. So what we did is now from those uh, lines, uh, we, from uh, cycle three, we submitted for DH, and we develop several lines and make a hybrid. Uh, you can see that under, under optimum, uh, the top five hybrids develop through rapid cycle genomic selection compared to the commercial check and the parent. You can see in all cases, the yield advantage uh, over the commercial check is from uh, 8.7 to 20%. Uh, and then, uh, of course, for compared to the parent, it is high. And then this is our focus, especially under drought, even it is high compared to the commercial check, uh, 47 to 98% uh, compared to the commercial check and also the parent.
Uh, so uh, just to give you now uh, some of those lines which develop so rapid cycle genomic selection, uh, those line is fixed line and it went to stage one, stage two, stage three, and also the hybrid is advanced uh, allocated to the partner. So this is the parent, uh, the lines develop through rapid cycle genomic selection and also uh, the parent in allocated hybrid. So the first one, it is a parent in one hybrid. For example, this line, it is a, the parent in uh, allocated three hybrid. So uh, some of uh, the hybrid, uh, which is currently uh, with the seed companies. And then you can see some of the lines uh, develop through rapid cycle, uh, uh, rapid cycle genomic selection, uh, some of the yield is uh, per se line per se yield is more than four tons uh, per hectare. Uh, and then as, as I said also in terms of drought uh, in Kiboko in Kenya, we have this uh, managed drought screening site, uh, almost 70 hectare. And then uh, we have the drip irrigation. Mm, so uh, depending on, uh, um, each hybrid and then we just withdraw uh, water at a critical time uh, two weeks before uh, before flowering and then we will not apply anything you can see the difference the susceptible uh, compared to the drought tolerant hybrid so uh, this just gives us confidence that rapid cycle uh, genomic selection uh, works uh, especially for for drought and also uh, uh, grain yield under drought and grain yield under optima. So the second part of um, <laughs> genomic selection uh, we have been using the last five years is uh, because we are um, generating several DH line, uh, we can't phenotype all of them <clears throat> under the stage one to stage four. So what we have been doing is uh, we only uh, uh, select representative of DH line from a particular set population and genotype all of them, sorry. Uh, so, and then use uh, those uh, uh, phenotype as a training set to predict the remaining one. So if you see here, uh, this is a training as a testing set. So you can see, uh, the one in the red is a testing set. Those are we selected and a phenotype in the field. The one in the uh, black dots, those ones are training set. So you can see uh, from uh, the training set and the uh, testing set is overlapping. So that's why the prediction accuracy is 0.84 under optimum and 0.92 under drought. Uh, and then another thing is uh, we also uh, just try to see if we just incorporate uh, a pedigree, uh, uh, Eduardo mentioned yesterday. Uh, so we also include that one in addition to marker, we also uh, put the pedigree. You can see if you use, uh, this is just uh, uh, the grain yield uh, of the predicted and then this is observed, the correlation between observed and predicted based on GBLAP is uh, 0.85. If you increase, if you also add uh, the pedigree relationship, you can slightly increase the prediction accuracy from 0.85 to 0.89. This is under optimum for grain yield. And for drought also the same thing, it's the only use a marker, prediction is 0 0.77, 0 0.2. And then if you include a pedigree relation matrix, you can increase the prediction accuracy uh, a little bit more. Uh, so another important thing is uh, in, 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 in maize, uh, uh, probably as most of uh, the maize breeders know, so we have, we have this two heterotic group uh, in maize, in, 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 uh, in, in CIMIT we call it heterotic group A, uh, which is uh, corresponds to stiff stock. And then heterotic group B in non stiff stock, uh, if you just uh, correlate with the temperate germplasm. So uh, the question here is uh, if you just do the prediction within tester and across tester, uh, you can see probably this might be uh, in tester one, the training set is around 111, in tester two, uh, 742. Uh, so, and then across tester, Actually, the prediction accuracy 
is slightly higher uh, compared to within tester. So, um, and then uh, this might be related to uh, the training set, uh, but uh, if you see here, uh, uh, if you have 742 as a testing a training set, the prediction accuracy, grain yield under well water is 0.6 and grain yield under water stress is 0.64, and this is uh, moisture and then anthracite and plant high. Uh, so if you use, assuming that uh, you have one population uh, across tester 850C, the prediction accuracy is slightly higher. So it is good. So especially if you have a small breeding program and then uh, if that, the accuracy, the prediction accuracy across tester is good and it is easy uh, in terms of uh, implementing genomic selection. So just to give you uh, <coughs> just a practical how we did it, uh, for example, uh, so this is a population, one population, uh, which is CML 536 by La Posta Sequia F64. Uh, so this La Posta Sequia F64 is a drought tolerant, low nitrogen tolerant population. And this line is an elite uh, mid altitude, uh, altitude line adapted to Eastern and Southern Africa. So I have a develop, develop a cross between this and then I received around 166 DH line. Uh, actually it's slightly higher uh, after seed increase and uh, do the first uh, uh, a screen with MSCB marker. So I have a total of 166 DH line. So at stage one, so there is no need for me to uh, phenotype all 166. Uh, so what I did is I only selected 88, half of them, uh, and then genotype all of 166. And, and then those stage one is evaluated. Uh, this is the number of location. You can see at the bottom, we have three optimum and one managed drought at stage one. Uh, and then here is the commercial check, uh, which gives around the, the best commercial check to around 7.6 ton per hectare. So, uh, and then, so this is, this is now the observed uh, GBLAP uh, uh, for phenotypic. So I selected around uh, a 10 to 15% selection intensity. The one which is uh, the white is based on the phenotypic data. And at the same time, you have the predicted value. Uh, Eduardo yesterday mentioned because we have genotype all of them, you have GBLAP for, for a particular for each individual line. And this is also under drought. Uh, so this is drought uh, based on phenotypic data. And then this is based on the marker data. And here, the one which is highlighted in blue, uh, because this material is not phenotype, it is only genotype. So you have the predicted value uh, based on genetic estimate breeding value for optimum and also for drought because it, uh, the, it is not phenotype. So this is just the total selection uh, from this 166. I have selected this line. And then I just want to see what is the performance of those which is uh, advanced through uh, phenotypic selection and advanced through genetic estimate breeding value in stage two. So. Uh, what we did is, so in total, uh, we selected 348 uh, <coughs> uh, lines from stage one. Uh, uh, so that is probably uh, around 14 or 15 population. Uh, and then uh, the tester, we just used three common tester, and we have the, around 1,000 hybrid. And out of these 348 lines, uh, almost half is advanced through phenotypic selection and the remaining is based on uh, genetic estimate breeding value. And then we evaluated those one uh, across location. Mm. So if you see here, the y-axis, this is a grain yield uh, ton per hectare, and this is a different uh, kind of, uh, different categories of hybrid. So if you see the total, the mean of all the 10, uh, 1042 hybrid, the mean is here around 7.5, 
And then from this, if you select about uh, 10 to 50 percent, the selected hybrid, regardless whether the advances through phenotypic or genetic estimate breeding value, uh, there is around 157 hybrid. The yield is close to uh, under optimum, close to nine ton per hectare. And then when I just go through out of this 157 hybrid, uh, 93 is, uh, came through phenotypic selection and the remaining 64 is coming from uh, genetic estimate breeding value. So here, uh, just simply what I did is I just consider this uh, 1042 as one group of hybrid and selected the top uh, 10 to 15% and then see uh, out of this, which is coming from phenotypic and genetic estimate breeding value. And the same true for drought. So you can see this is just slightly uh, a change here. Uh, most of 93 uh, hybrid coming through phenotypic selection and 64 is from uh, genetic estimate breeding value. But under drought, uh, 66 is coming from uh, phenotypic selection and 91 is coming from genetic estimate breeding value. I think that is probably what Eduardo said. Uh, if the heritability is low, uh, GBLAP is more in terms of uh, selection accuracy. So that might be uh, the reason uh, under drought because we have only one location and the heritability is low. So probably it's selection based on GBLAP is higher than selection based on uh, uh, BLAP. So, uh, so the, from this study uh, is, we can just conclude that genetic estimate, if, if you select lines based on GEP, it is uh, the same as uh, selecting through phenotypic selection. And the advantage here is the cost ratio. Uh, so the cost ratio is you can just uh, uh, save 32% of the total cost uh, using genetic estimate breeding value because you, do, you don't need to uh, phenotype across location. And the cost of genotyping is slightly is, is low compared to uh, the cost of phenotyping. Uh, and then just just if you go uh, just for to show you just uh, in, in one population. So this is the one I just I showed you. Uh, so this is a hybrid. Uh, uh, so this is a commercial check. And this is a hybrid under drought. You can see some of them are coming through phenotypic selection. Some are from genetic estimate breeding value. And this is a yield increase. The same for drought. So. Uh, this just gives us confidence that you can just use uh, genomic, genomic, value, genomic estimate breeding value to, to uh, uh, estimate uh, the breeding value of untested uh, new lines. Um, and then, so that one is just within. So what we did is now, uh, because we started this work uh, uh, in 2017, and now we just want to see what about prediction across years. So that is one of, uh, so um, we have uh, uh, in 2017, we have 923 lines, which is genotype and phenotype in 2018, 1,400 in 2019, 722. And all of them are uh, genotype with uh, uh, medium density markers. And we have, uh, phenotypic under optimum in the drought. So our just uh, uh, our question was now: Is it possible just to predict uh, using a previous year data and then predicting the next year data? So that is uh, our question. So um, we use a different scenario. One is just using the 2017 data and predict the 2018 or 2019 data. Uh, the second scenario is uh, using 2017 and 18 uh, together and predicting uh, the 2019 data. And also we uh, did in addition to that, uh, what about if you convert 5% uh, of uh, the prediction set to the training set? Uh, so just so that you can just increase that the connectivity uh, among the training and testing set. So this is, this is the data, this, this is a, 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 a genotype uh, uh, um, relation matrix. Uh, you can see the 2017 
lines in the red, 2008 is in blue and 2009. So from uh, this uh, genotypic uh, relation matrix, you can see there is some relation among uh, the three years. So that means you can just uh, 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 predict a little bit uh, better. And so uh, this is a, a phenotypic distribution for the 2017 uh, 2000, uh, uh, the 2017, 2018, and 2019 data, uh, grain yield under uh, wall water and grain yield under drought, uh, anthesis state and plant height. Uh, so he, here is a result. So if you, if you use uh, a 2017 uh, as a training set and then predicting the 2018 uh, as a testing set, you can see for grain yield, this is for grain yield. So the prediction you can see here is 2017, 2018. And if you're using one year 2017 data to predict 2019, and this is 2018, 2019, you can see the prediction accuracy for grain yield uh, is relatively low. Uh, it is around, okay, around uh, here is around two point something. And this is for drought. The drought is slightly better. But if you just convert 10% uh, from a testing set, that means from the 2018 data, only uh, moving 10% of the material as your training set, the prediction accuracy is significantly increased in all cases. And if you increase, if you just use 30%, the prediction accuracy significantly increased in all cases. So what just this tells us is uh, there should be a little bit, at least a, a certain point of connectivity between your uh, training set and the prediction set. So in other words, instead of phenotyping 15% of your population, you can phenotype either 10% and 13% each year. And so that, that will just be useful for to update your uh, training set. And then uh, another one is what we did also, we used the 2017 and 2018 data and predict the 2019 data. You can see the grain yield. So using two-year data, you can predict the third-year data. The prediction accuracy is around 0 0.31 uh, for grain yield under well water and 0 0.32 under drought. And at the same time, if you, even if you convert 10%, uh, 15%, uh, uh, the prediction is accuracy is increased. So even using this prediction accuracy 0 0.32, 0 0.31 is, is, is very good. So you can just use the previous two years data and you can predict the third year data uh, without doing any phenotyping. Uh, so um, and this year in 2021, uh, what we are currently is doing is just uh, a sparse design uh, for genomic selection. Uh, so currently we are doing that. Uh, for example, I have here 16 population uh, from population one to population six. This is the number of line genotype in each population. Uh, and this is the number of DH line phenotype. What I did here is actually I took only 30% from, because from the previous result, uh, we said if you increase, if you only use 30% uh, from prediction set to training set, the prediction accuracy is high. So what I did here is uh, I just only use 30% of uh, to 200 line. So currently uh, I'm evaluating in the field uh, 894 uh, uh, individual lines as, as a test cross, uh, but I have genotype uh, around 2,685 lines. And then uh, we also did is a sparse phenotyping uh, currently. Initially, uh, normally what I do is two optimum, uh, uh, one rep, uh, no, no, two rep at, at, at one side, uh, but what we currently we did is, okay, uh, with the same number of plot, uh, which is uh, for two sides, uh, two, uh, two, two, two optimum sides, 
I need 3,576 plot. But what we did here, here, okay, can we just do, instead of uh, phenotyping at two sites, can we just phenotype at three sites, but the number of plots is the same. So we just use some um, sparse phenotyping. So in, in, in sites one and two, we just use this 447. Uh, so this is uh, 447 in all the site. And the remaining 447 uh, is divided into three sites. So we just use this design and currently uh, the trials in the field, I think we will get the result in the coming months or two. So we also did a work with Eduardo in terms of uh, to see uh, what is the effect of uh, recycling at stage one, stage two, stage three uh, to increase uh, genetic gain. So from simulation, you can see that uh, previously we were uh, recycling after uh, stage three. That is actually in terms of year from crossing to go to stage three, it requires five years. Uh, but if you recycle without changing anything, if you recycle at stage two, uh, you can increase the yield of genetic gain uh, by 9% compared to stage three. But if you uh, recycle line at stage one, uh, you can increase the genetic gain 70% compared to stage three. Uh, so this is uh, uh, currently uh, we are doing, um, we started the work. Uh, I think Gary also, he gave us advice in terms of implementing the right recycled genomic selection. So uh, we are working on the logistic. Uh, uh, so uh, the lesson from uh, the last several years, uh, one thing we have to is uh, there should be a proper planning and coordination among uh, different stakeholders. So it is not done by a breeder or a molecular breeder or biometrician or quantitative genetics. So it is a, a teamwork. So there should be uh, that co uh, collaboration and also reliable service provider. Uh, that is the most important thing. Uh, so if you don't get the data uh, from leaf sampling, uh, genotyping data analysis within uh, a short period of time, uh, you will miss the whole, uh, the whole, the whole trial. Uh, because if you if you miss uh, pollination, uh, that means uh, the cycle time is uh, already gone. And then um, uh, one important thing is we need uh, at least a minimum database uh, which can link phenotype and genotype. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to do uh, this rapid cycle genomic selection or any uh, without uh, a reasonable database that can link phenotype and genotype. Uh, and number four is uh, a common uh, genotyping platform. I think uh, I'm happy that as the previous speaker uh, mentioned that uh, because uh, when we start it is GBS and the last couple of years is RAMSIC. Uh, so uh, there is effort now to uh, uh, use those data to integrate with DART. Uh, so that is also very important. So uh, this is uh, my last slide. Thank you very much for your uh, listening. If you have questions, I'll try to answer. Thanks. Thank you, Asa.